Perfect. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our final session in the AIA California's Monterey Design Conference University. My name is Ann Cotter, AIA. I'm AIA California's Vice President of Communication and Public Relations, and I'll be your moderator for today's segment. This afternoon's presentation is being brought to you by Plant Prefab, a legacy partner of the 2021 Monterey Design Conference. Just a reminder, it's not too late to join us for the first MDC on the road, coming to wherever you are. This virtual format is our way of inviting you to see what makes the Monterey Design Conference the architect's retreat and why we have so many loyal attendees. Our headliner speakers this year will join us from Portugal, Japan, England, Boston, and of course, California. Clear your calendar next Thursday and Friday, October 21st and 22nd, and carve out time to focus on these amazing architects and how their work is shaping the world. More details on our amazing lineup of speakers and registration are available online at montereydesignconference.org. A few quick housekeeping reminders before we get started with today's presentation. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions for today's presenter. We can, you can also like a question to move it to the top of the queue. Uh, today's session qualifies for a one AIA learning unit for those watching live. AIA California staff will report your atten attendance for you. Um, the session is also being recorded and will be posted on the AIA California website uh, shortly after today's presentation. So now on to today's uh, session. The goal of this course is to provide an overview of prefabrication, basic design principles, and how prefabrication expands upon the capabilities and experiences of traditional site-based construction. The course also provides insights on how to use technology to optimize the process and how design professionals can begin taking advantage of the many benefits of prefabricated construction for the residential projects. The design criteria are intended to be used as early in the design and planning process as possible, particularly before engineering is completed, as engineering for prefab differs from that of site-based construction. I would like to quickly introduce today's presenter before getting this program started. Amy Sims helped launch Plant Prefab and Plant's predecessor, the award-winning residential design studio, Living Homes. She now guides Plant's design strategy managing architect partnerships, design review services, and the development of new standard home designs. Amy's passion for sustainable design dates back to an undergraduate internship at Vermont's Yestermoro Design Build School, where she was immersed in energy efficient building techniques decades before they entered the mainstream. She worked as a framer and finish carpenter for several years before attending grad school, and her first job in architecture was building quarter scale models. These hands-on experiences early in her career imparted a wealth of knowledge about construction means and methods that informed Amy's pioneering work at Living Homes and Plant Prefab. Take it away, Amy. Thank you so much. I, is my screen being shared? Everybody can see it okay? Yep, Okay. Looks great. great. Okay, because I'm not getting the highlighted image on my screen, so I just wanted to make sure. Great. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Anne. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I just wanted to take a, a quick side note um, and just kind of explain a little bit more about the transition from living homes to plant prefab. So with living homes, we were a design studio. We worked on prefabricated projects. Um, we designed our own projects as well as working with Karen Timberlake and Ray Cappy. And in the course of 10 years, we worked with 10 different factories. And the challenge that we always had was controlling the quality, sustainability, and cost for our homes. And we realized that we really had to own the production. So in 2016, Plant Prefab was founded and we've developed a patented plant building system and factory designed specifically for custom residential projects. We've learned a lot through the years, both from other factories, general contractors, as well as architects. And we're happy to share some of these lessons with you so you too can take advantage of the quality time and cost advantages of prefabricated construction. And as Anne noted, as you're going through this 
please feel free to update your questions in the chat. And yeah, it's prefabs moment. Um, there was a survey completed by Dodge Data and Analytics of over 600 GCs, engineers, and specialty trades. And so I'm just having a little bit of technical difficulties here. Bear with me one second. Um, 88% reported greatly improved cost predictability when incorporating prefabrication instead of stick built methods. 86% reported increased client satisfaction and a full 90% reported greatly improved quality and schedule certainty. So that's why we're here. The goal of this course is really to help you understand how you can take advantage of these benefits. And, and as Anne said in the intro, it's really important to consider these criteria as early on in the process as possible. And one aside, I just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware all the images that we're gonna be showing in this presentation are all actual prefab projects. This first one is a Ray Cappy design. I love the fact that Ray embraces structure in all of his work. So you can actually see where the two modules are coming together in the middle of this kitchen. This course is gonna help you understand the different types of prefabrication typologies and how to determine if a project is a good fit for prefab. The process for a typical custom prefab project, including the approval process and the role that site plays in what and how you design, We'll also look at design considerations and the unique considerations for SMEP coordination and the overall project scope of work. In this section, we'll also look at some case studies to understand construction, transport, install, and on-site completion. The criteria for evaluating and choosing a prefabricator for your own work is also the last section that we'll cover. This is an image of another Ray Cappy home. And again, I'll just point out, you know, Ray does love to expose the structure so you can actually see four modules coming together, the beams in the background of the ceiling, and then the beams of the double height space above. Prefabricated really just refers to any construction that happens off site. I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but you know, really they're five basic types. Manufactured homes, also considered mobile homes, are built entirely off-site, but the big distinction is that these are built to HUD code and can't be put on a permanent foundation. Modular falls under the factory built housing program, which is built to the same code as stick built construction. Panelization, more work happens on site to finish it. These can be structurally insulated panels, roof panels, wall panels. And then there's kits. Kits are come as numbered parts and pieces that are then assembled completely on site. And then finally, there's a hybrid approach. Some factories like plant prefab use this as a way to offer more design opportunities for architects by combining both modules and panels. There's a number of criteria really to think about when considering if prefab is a good fit for your project. And here are the questions that you should ask at the very beginning of the project. You know, the first thing really, is the site feasible? Site build construction, there's usually not very many constraints with the exception of zoning and cost. Prefab, the site location is actually gonna determine your design constraints, transport constraints, module constraints, craning. So the implication is it's really critical to complete a feasibility assessment before you really get into any design. And then the next thing, can your design be built with certain prefab systems or do you need to modify your design to make prefab work for you? Again, 
site built projects design usually isn't that much of a consideration except for whatever the constraints of that particular site have with prefab you know thinking about more rectilinear designs is natural for prefab curves and complex geometries just become a little bit more challenging modules are constrained again by their site by the transport route um, and then panels offer a greater flexibility so the implication for this is thinking about what's the optimization for the prefab components that you want for your project there are some factories that allow for customization like this. There are other factories that really only restrict what you can and can't do. Is there local labor to complete your project? Site built, sometimes just getting subcontractors to show up to the job site can be a challenge. And local labor rates can really vary greatly from city to city. In prefab, most factories have full-time employees, so labor shortages is not an issue and also some focus on higher quality custom architectural projects. Implication here is if local labor is a challenge for specific project requirements, then prefab might be a nice solution for you. Are there schedule constraints for the project? Site built has long linear process and is often subjected to weather, subcontractor and inspection delays and is generally less predictable. Prefab, has parallel construction, indoor production, schedules are typically faster and thus much more predictable. The implication is if you're looking for a faster schedule and or predictability of schedule for your project, then prefab might be a better approach. Are there budget constraints? Is your client concerned about cost or potential change orders? Site built projects, local labor can be expensive. Site GCs often underbid and rely on change orders. In prefab, the offsite construction can be a lower cost, but then you need to think about the cost of transport and installation, which adds costs. Most factories contract with a fixed price, so change orders are reduced to a minimum. Implication for this then is if cost is not always an advantage of prefab, but predictable budget and schedule is, well, then prefab might be the solution for you. Quality control. What's the expectation of finished quality? Site built, there's a lot less supervision of the contract subcontractor's quality of work. In prefab, factories are required to have a QAA process in place, which ensures owners and attention to detail. And then the final level of finish that gets completed in the factory is really determined by the constraints of that particular factory and their customization, and also the transportation route. The implication then is it's best to clarify the expectation of the clients if they're willing to make a trade for more upfront work being completed in the factory in exchange for the advantages that prefab can have, which is speed, cost, and or predictability. And then as your client concerned about health and sustainability. In site built, projects are built to spec. Most GCs don't really vet their materials for health or sustainability. And we know that construction waste is a huge problem. And then subcontractors are oftentimes driving hundreds and hundreds of miles to a job site. In prefab, most of the employees are living close by. They're coming to just one job site every single day. Uh, materials are vetted. Some factories actually vet their materials for health and sustainability, and then typically there's less construction waste. So if health and sustainability is a priority for your client, then looking for a factory that allows for more customization might make a good fit. Overall project speed is arguably the greatest advantage of prefab. So on the screen here, we have a comparison of prefab versus site-built constructions. Typically, the timeline for design, coordination, and engineering for prefab occurs in a similar process as site construction. Where it begins to differ is just before the construction begins during the shop drawing phase. State approval and local permits are submitted when all engineering has been completed and coordinated. 
And I'll get into more specifics on that later on in the presentation. But for now, just know that there's an approval process for the factory built portion, and that's not a permit. The state package is reviewed and approved by a third party agency, which has been approved by the state of California. This is then submitted along with your local permit for all of your foundations and anything else that's being site built. Once the permit is received for the site work, a contract can be executed for the prefab process to begin, as well as mobilizing the site work. For prefab projects, the construction work occurs in parallel. Site and prefab elements are constructed simultaneously. Multiple floors are built all at the same time. So in overall, the schedule can be about 20 to 50% faster than site built. And that's really based on the overall project design and the scope of work. Just a little side note, I love showing this particular home because it's a simple four module home. The garage is actually inside the module. You can see that on the end with the plywood. So on site, the only work left to finish was the interior of the garage, the garage door. You can see the bulk of the siding material is installed. There was um, waterproofing and structural connections that had to happen at the vertical and horizontal mate lines. But essentially, you know, again, based on what your project desire goals are, sometimes it makes sense to build as much as possible in the factory to save time on site. For the purpose of this presentation, we've organized the custom prefab process into five key milestones. Site feasibility, design engineering and approvals, scope of work, factory fabrication, and then delivery, install, and stitch. The first step in understanding if prefab is an option for your project is the site analysis. You don't have to do this. Many factories will do this as a service for you. And it's critical because the feasibility analysis ultimately defines your overall project design constraints. So the things that we're looking at are, what's the route from the factory to your site? Are there any obstacles? Are there low hanging trees? Are there hairpin turns? Are there power lines at your site? Anything that's going to affect either the transportation or the actual installation of the prefab components onto your site. So by that, we're determining what's the maximum size unit that you can design. You know, can you actually fit full volumetric mods on your site or are you limited in some way? And the timing of this is critical because you wanna do this and really have it impact your design as early on as possible. The other things to consider is staging for the crane. Is there enough room on the street or on your site for the crane? Is there staging available for modules? So this isn't something that you have to think about on your own, but partnering with a factory, this is going to ultimately impact the design and create a better project outcome. The site in this image is in Los Angeles, and it's a through lot bounded by a very busy street to the north, Sunset Boulevard, and a narrow residential street to the south. The project scope included a demo of the existing 8,000 square foot home to be replaced with a custom prefab design. So the first step in this analysis told us that the crane needed to be placed on the smaller street due to the traffic on Sunset Boulevard. The maximum size crane that would fit in this location then ultimately determined the size and placement of the modules, and it was determined the best option was for four complete modules to create the guest wing and studio space, and then to site build the remainder of the house. The architect of record is responsible for ensuring that the project complies with all applicable zoning laws, regulations, and restrictions, including review by any 
applicable specialty agencies like Coastal Commission, Architectural Design Review Board, the state approval agency who reviews the drawings of the factory built portion will only review basic building codes and fire codes as they apply to the state of California. They're reviewing the project essentially in a vacuum, devoid of any local jurisdiction requirements. That's up to you as the architect of record. And just so you know, not all states in the, United, in the US have prefab programs. So all of the information I'm sharing today is specific only to the state of California. And the, the factory built housing program falls underneath the jurisdiction of Housing and Community Development, HCD. These factory built housing units are designed to the same building code as the state. And then separately, a design approval agency or a DAA, which is assigned by the HCD, reviews and approves the, the factory plans. There are 13 such designated agencies. And then the same agency will go to the factory and conduct all of the required inspections. The prefab factory will submit your drawing package to the DAA on behalf of the architect and get all of the approvals. The stamped and signed approval package is not a permit, it's merely an approval, but then this gets submitted in conjunction with your local drawing package for all the work to be completed on site. The image in this slide is of that same sunset project we talked about earlier, where they're installing this first module on the foundation. Perhaps the most critical portion of the overall process is the scope of work. The scope of work clarifies exactly who's doing what and is ultimately decided as a team between the factory and the site GC. Getting the site, site general contractor on board as soon as possible helps to ensure a successful project by having their input and alignment on this scope of work. That way we, there's clear understanding of budget and there's a clear understanding of the installation and the final fit of the modules on site. The image in this photo is of that same Sunset Boulevard project. You can see all the grading that had to be done in order to get the crane to fit because the other consideration is getting the transport trucks to the site, getting past the crane so it can be picked up and then put on the foundation that you see in the background. This is an image of the new design on top of the site. You can see the, the back main home, which was site built due to the reach of the crane that was gonna be on Denslow. And then here are the module portions, and then there was an existing site built garage. Site work typically requires much less time than the factory portion. So understanding the overall project timeline is critical to the factory production start date. Some factories create shop drawings which integrate SMEP to prevent any conflicts during fabrication, which assists to make the factory build time much more efficient. It makes the pre-construction period a lot longer, but ultimately once the factory starts production, they can go smoothly and uninterruptedly because they've already sorted out all of the conflicts that may arise and all the RFIs have already been issued before fabrication begins. Each factory has its own method for constructing the prefab components. Modules can be constructed side by side to ensure proper alignment. Multiple story projects can be constructed all at the same time, which is another cost savings rather than having to wait for that first floor to be completed to start framing on the second floor. Some factories like the one shown in this photo are also automated, equipped with cutting and layout machinery, enabling them to achieve high quality deliverables extremely fast. 
The use of these tools also supports quality. This allows factories to automate processes, facilitating a consistent high level of quality control and reducing material waste. The precision fact fabrication of exterior wall components also produces a much tighter building envelope with fewer air leaks. Even without automated equipment, simply working indoors in a monitored manufacturing setting helps the production move much more quickly with generally much tighter quality than site built. All the electrical and plumbing systems are tested for function before shipping, another QAA component. And since the building components are produced and stored in an enclosed facility, exposure to humidity and other environmental factors that cause moisture related damage is negated, which in turn increases the durability of the components and reduces the potential for mold growth that affects indoor air quality. The amount of finished work in the factory is predetermined by that scope of work document that I talked about earlier. Based on your overall project goals, sometimes it's desirable to complete as much as possible in the factory like in this image. This is a one module guest house that was delivered with everything completed with the exception of some glass windows. You can see a mullionless corner window that would not have survived transport. So that was installed on site, as well as some exterior finishes that you'll see in the next slide. But the flooring, tile work, cabinets, there's a full bathroom behind me in this photo, light fixtures, sprinklers, everything is installed. The exterior, because of a trellis and deck that were going to be site installed, some of the siding was left off. And the siding's also left off because there are structural connections that need to be made from the module to the foundation. Most factories require a visit by the owner, architect, or developer to sign off on the units prior to shipping. This is similar to punch, punch lists that you may do on the site construction. Final inspections are conducted by the DAA and insignias are installed on all the panels and components to identify to the local inspector that these units have already been inspected by the state. Chip loose items, materials, components that are going to be installed on site after delivery are shipped loose via inside the modules or sometimes in a separate trailer. And this is all again planned during that scope of work discussion. The larger modules depicted in this slide are wrapped and ready for transportation. Some factories will store the modules if required, but for the most part, they're delivered as soon as they're completed. The inset image shows panels being wrapped and ready for transport. The installation during installation duration is based on the number of modules and panels, and it can vary from one day to several. The stitch is the work that is completed on installation day to get the module structurally connected to the foundation and to each other. The buildings will also be weather tight by the end of installation day or soon after. The project pictured here has two townhomes, three modules each, set around a site-built garage as seen in the middle of the photo. The set of all six modules in this project took five hours. This quick installation and weather tightening is especially helpful in places like this, Lake Tahoe, where the construction season is very short and limited by weather. If you take nothing else from this course, I want you to remember these five pieces of advice. Uh, committing early, super important for the whole project success. Designing for components, really making sure that you're optimizing for your particular site, the best type of componentry, whether it's modules or panels. Like, same with designing for transport based on that feasibility analysis, what are the right types that are going to give you the best product for your project? Um, 
Lots of factories use design parametric tools and then defining that scope of work. Basic components for prefab really fall into two basic categories, panels and modules, or some combination of them. And that module panel allocation occurs during that initial schematic design concept. All the images you're gonna see in these next series of slides are based on that same Tahoe project. There are different kinds of modules. Modules can be large fully volumetric or smaller core mods. Most factories construct large fully volumetric modules as they allow for a faster installation and site finish. When designing for an all module project, a good practice is to design bathrooms, kitchens, so that they can be contained within one module so that as much work as possible can be finished. This maximizes efficiency in construction and installation, thus typically reducing project cost. The other type of mod is a core mod. Core mods typically are designed to contain the heaviest and most labor intensive parts of the home, kitchens, bathrooms, mechanical rooms, and mechanical equipment. Core mods are still considered volumetric. They're typically smaller. They have all the finishes, floors, walls, and ceilings. And what this does is it allows for greater design flexibility by completing the rest of the project, either with additional core modules or panels. Wall panels can be either sheer, or non-load bearing, they may include plumbing or electrical or mechanical, and that really is dependent upon the factory that you're working with. They can also include windows and doors, as you see in this image here. Floor panels are structural and may include finishes. It really depends on the design and the structural connections. Roof panels are typically structural, may include insulation, they may include lighting, they may include sprinklers. Again, it really depends on your design and the factory that you're working with. Panels versus modules is something that really relates to your particular design. And again, going back to your site, what were the constraints upon your sites? The advantages and disadvantages of them are panels are smaller components, allow for greater design flexibility, and modules are always limited to your site constraints, the height limitations, width limitations, Transportation panels are a lot easier to ship. They're smaller, you can stack them. There's greater efficiency there. There's really no limitations with modules. We've built modules at plant prefab as wide as 16 feet, as long as 65 feet. Now we're really limited in terms of where we can go with that module, but we've already decided that through our feasibility analysis but the transportation of that unit is now gonna require pilot cars. And then if you're traveling on some roads, you may even be required to have a police escort. The site, we talked a lot about that. Um, with panels, you can get away with a much smaller crane. The installation time is about the same as modules, maybe a little bit slower, but the real distinction is there's a lot more work that has to be finished on site with panels. With modules, they're having to have a much bigger crane. It's a lot faster to install the modules to be able to complete the project. And then typically there's less labor involved if these are all full volumetric modules. But then there's also this hybrid approach. 
which allows much more flexibility in design when you incorporate both modules and panels. And this is a system that Plant Prefab is doing a lot for most of our projects right now. Advances in technology offer integrated engineering systems that translate designs into virtual building instructions faster and far more precisely than traditional manual methods through CAD-based programs. These hybrid solutions also allow for faster weather type project installation for sites with more significant shipping and installation changes. It also increases access opportunities for sites that may be challenging for transport and or installation with larger modules. Ultimately, the best solution for your project is determined by the design and overall project goals. Time and cost efficiencies and overall project timeline or project cost, or is there an issue with labor which is driving your desire to go prefab? Here's an example of a hybrid project. This is an ADU that was designed by Plant Prefab. It has a core mod consisting of a bathroom kitchen and mechanical, and then the rest of it is panels. We have roof panels, floor panels, and wall panels. It can also be designed as a full module, or it can be completely panelized. So the idea is that we're offering lots of different opportunities for different site constraints. Unlike many site-built projects, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing needs to be fully coordinated and part of the design process, and you can't treat it like design, build, and prefab. That's one of the biggest takeaways, I think, for this presentation when it comes to design and thinking. The consideration of the MEP really needs to start at the schematic, thinking about chases both vertically and horizontally so that all these on-site connections can be made. As an example, if plumbing is on the exterior wall, as it is in this diagram, a chase wall really needs to get built so that there's a clear run for all of the supply, waste, and venting that can bypass the rim joists on the floors and ceilings of the mods below. This diagram also shows the parts that must be installed on site. Typically, the drywall is left off in order to be able to make those on-site connections, whether they're structural or plumbing. Some mod-to-mod -mod connections happen horizontally, and these also need to be coordinated. Connections may happen through the beams if required, or in some instances, soffits may need to be created during the design phase. Some factories use quick connects for the electrical to make it a faster and seamless installation on-site. There's also flooring and shear structural connections that happen where the flooring is left off. In this image, there's two modules coming together. The ceiling is left off at the drywall and the finished floor is also left off. And you can see those quick connects hanging from the ceiling. The first project we're going to look at is a really small, simple, single family home designed by Plant Prefab and installed in the Bay Area. This site allowed for the home to be built as two volumetric modules and a site built garage. And what I like about this project is we actually have one very large core module. If you notice, bathrooms and the kitchens are all contained within one module, so we're not having to cross any mechanical or plumbing across mod to mod. The flooring and drywall is installed in the factory and left off at the mate lines so that the on-site connections can be made. And again, in this, you can see we've got the two by four chase wall so that all of the plumbing drops right into that crawl space for an easy installation on site. The mechanical, you can see here, it's distributed again in that same core mod. 
Typically, modules are installed on top of the standard stem wall foundation with a crawl space below. But there's other types of foundation methodologies that can also be used, whether it's helical piles or other pile foundations. Slab on grade is possible, but it offers installation challenges from all of the utility hookups. This simple diagram just shows the, the way that the module is connected to the foundation with a shear strip that attaches the floor joists to the site installed sill plate. Since this home was only two modules, the installation occurred in one day, roughly four hours. The far right photo shows the raised foundation and the slab for the garage in the foreground. Crane size and location was all determined during that feasibility analysis. And then after assembly on the foundation, the components were secured to the foundation and to each other. And then the, all the utility connections were completed on site by the general contractor in that crawl space. The siding material was left off at both the mate lines vertically in the back and on the side, there was a site built overhang that went the full length of the building. So that material was left off. The things that were to be completed on site included the finishing of the roof material, the siding, the drywall in the interior and the flooring. This next project is a slightly larger home that uses a hybrid approach of both mods and panels. It was designed by the Brown Studio for a new development in Tahoe called the Palisades. Plant Prefab constructed several dozen of these homes with five different plan variations. The entire project is made up of four modules and 35 panels. Two modules on the first floor, seven panels on the walls, three floor panels. The second floor consists of two mods, three wall panels, two floor panels, and four roof panels for the garage. The rest of the roof consists of six panels. The prefab components are constructed in the factory while the foundation and utility connections are completed by the site general contractor. This particular project has a separate installation crew that was hired by the site GC who was solely responsible for the coordination of the train and the trans transport. Some general contractors can self-perform this work. When speaking with a general contractor, it's important to understand if they have modular experience or not. On installation day, the crane lifts and sets the components into place. These particular components were all lifted with a spreader bar and straps below the modules. All the components were set in roughly 15 working hours. The components were attached to the foundation and one another, and then the utility connections were completed on site. Here's a video that shows the installation sequence of the modules and panels. And in this last image, I'll show you that you can see the two modules on the right hand side stacking on top of each other. The panelization part is that section between the garage and the right-hand module, and that's a staircase. So if you think about it, it's a double height space. If we were to ship that as a module, we're shipping air. There's really nothing in it. So the exterior walls were built as two panels. The floor on the ground level was built as panels. The staircase is actually built in the factory at Plant Prefab as a single steel stringer. So it's really, if you think about it, this project really consists of a whole kit of parts.
And this next project is a multifamily project called the Garden Village. It's an apartment complex in Berkeley, California that was designed by Stanley Sadowitz. It's composed of 18 freestanding buildings connected by a network of gardens and walkways. And what I love about this project is the simplicity. The entire project was constructed using a system containing just two types of modules. He had type A and type B. And then through the careful arrangement, he created two different floor types, two bedroom and a four bedroom. The module stacks are connected by site installed steel bridges. And these could have actually been fabricated in a factory that makes panels. And again, that would be something that would be considered during your scope of work and, and designing phase. The two module types were first built as full-scale mock-ups in the factory so that they could determine what the final finishes were. This is an example of what's called a top pick installation. Because it's a steel frame, it was easy to do this. And I don't know if you can tell, but if you notice, these modules actually don't have ceilings on them. So one thing to consider with prefabrication with volumetric modules is the redundancy of structure that we have by having a floor framing and a ceiling framing. For this particular project, they had a really tight max height for their building. So what they did is they built with a steel frame. So there's a floor only. It's more like a site build construction where the module floor of the one above acts as the ceiling. So in that way, they were able to reduce the overall height of the building by four feet by eliminating this extra ceiling structure. And the only way they could do this was to do it with steel frame and then have a diaphragm that created that rigid box that could be picked up by the crane. The exterior siding was installed in the factory with the exception at the floor area as seen in the next photograph. The finished material was left off in order to make the on-site structural and weatherproofing connections. Here are the things to think about when you're considering the selection of a prefab supplier. Logistics, are they able to cost effectively and logistically serve your project location based on shipping costs and service regions? Focus, do they do custom work? Do they specialize and or have experience in the kind of work you want, whether it's single family or multifamily? And then do they have extensive experience working with third party architects? Capabilities. What kind of prefab system do they use and how that might impact your design, whether it's panels, modules, or both? And then do they do their own shop drawings from which the project will be completed or are they relying on your drawing package? Guidelines, does the factory offer a set of design guidelines to help you understand how best to design for prefab? Or do they have a process to work with you through all the stages of the design process. And then finally, installation. How do they manage the transport and installation of your modules? Is the factory FOB or are they actually coordinating that as well? And that's it. I'll now look at any questions that anybody may have. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Um, that was a great presentation. And um, I see there are a number of Q&A questions. So we're going to jump right over to those. Um, so at the top, um, what are the challenges that prevent MEP and finishes going on the panel in the shop? I'm sorry, ask that question again. Um, what challenge? Sorry, what challenges prevent MEP and finishes going on the panels in the shop? Um, the challenges are sometimes connections. 
there's sometimes based on the design, what's happening with the panel next to a floor, where's the panel being? Um, it's really design specific. Okay. And um, there's a couple of code questions. Are code um, required inspections made in the field or um, and how do, how do the small modules get inspected? And also, uh, is it um, following a California code or is it as per where it's manufactured? Yeah, so everything follows California building code. Um, it's reviewed and approved by that design approval agency that I talked about earlier. That same design approval agency comes into the factory, does all the inspections. Um, if there's additional third party inspections that need to happen, whether it's CASP or HERS or LEED certification, any inspection that would need to happen before all the walls get closed up, that could also happen in the factory. Okay, great. Um, if panels allow greater design flexibility and less redundant structure, why use modules at all? I mean, great question. The, the real answer to that is the amount of finished work that then you have to do on site, right? So that's why that hybrid approach offers you a little bit more flexibility. If you do the core mods, the things that have the most amount of finishes and infrastructure like plumbing, electrical, maybe even mechanical, if you think about your design in that way, now you're getting a lot of things completed in the factory with panels, there's less finish work typically because of how the panels get stacked, how they're shipped. Um, you're, you're limited a lot in terms of, an, of how much can get completed in the factory versus on site. So that's why you really have to think about it for your project. Why do you wanna do prefab in the first place? And the answer to that will dictate whether you want mods or panels or a combination. Okay. Um, so typically, most prefab factories are interested in larger, more repetitive uh, multi-module projects in the 100 to 200 dwelling unit range. How many factories, other than plant prefab, are interested in smaller projects with a more panelized versus strictly module approach? Um, follow on, kind of also, um, what is the smallest panelized project um, plant prefab has worked on and uh, or will take on, I should say? And what is the recommended threshold for the minimum number of panels, or minimum number of modules on potential projects to be cost-effective? Sorry, there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, all of those questions are, are, are project-specific. There are other factories that don't do large-scale projects. I don't know how many off the top of my head, but there are other ones out there. Um, I don't know how many other factories are doing both modules and panels, though. Um, and the, the smallest project that we've built at Plant Prefab is that ADU that I showed you. That was 496 square feet. Um, at a certain point, the cost to make something really small may not make sense for your project. So that's why you really have to think about when, when the question is how small a project can we build, we can build anything, but the cost of what we're building and transporting doesn't make sense for your project. You know, those are the things that you really have to weigh. Um, and then uh, was the module pre-permitted in California or was it treated as a standard construction firm? Wait, ask that question again. Sorry? I didn't understand that question. Can you, can you repeat oh. it? So was the module pre-permitted in California or was it treated as a standard construction permit? A standard what? Construction permit, building permit. Oh, no. So um, there is a separate approval process. So there's a whole packet of drawings that needs to get submitted to the DAA, which is the Design Approval Agency. So that's a set of drawings that includes everything that's going to get built in the factory needs to get reviewed and approved by this third party agency that represents the state of California. That same packet of drawings is used to conduct all the inspections by that same third party agency. And then that approved signed and stamped set of drawings becomes part of your submittal packet to the local jurisdiction that shows this is all the work that's being done 
in the factory versus whatever work you're doing down on site. So hopefully it, it actually expedites the local building permit process. It, it does because there's less for that local plan checker to review. They're only reviewing the portion that's done on site. They're looking at zoning. Zoning still has to be approved. So that's not that the state doesn't do that. And then um, yeah, that's it. Okay, great. Um, how does cost per square foot compare to site building on average? For the prefabricated versus you know building conventionally? Um, it can vary from project to project, obviously depending on specifications, but for the most part, it's about the same, you know, in a factory like ours, that's not an automated facility, we're still building the same way. Um, so it's based on your specifications and, um, you know, fixtures and finishes and everything else that's going in there. The cost savings then comes into the overall project timeline. So because, and again, depending on the size of your project, we're building a lot more, we can build faster in the factory. So typically that project I showed you, the case study that's up in Tahoe, it's a 2,600 square foot home. We built that in the factory in two months, the whole entire thing with all the finishes, everything. So the exterior finishes are done, the interior bathrooms and kitchens, appliances, everything's installed. So that's done in two months for 2,600 square feet. It then takes them an additional two to three months to complete that on site. So their overall build time is reduced to six to eight months. So that's where that cost savings really comes in. Okay, time is money. Um, do you see a roadmap for prefab to reduce the cost of construction? And what kind of innovations could make this possible? Yeah, great question. Um, we've just started the um, implementation of a new factory that we're putting together that will be fully automated. And that's really, you know, people have been doing this in Japan and in Sweden for years. And that's really where updating that velocity where we're building panels at a much greater rate. We're able to move a lot more through the factory at the same time. So that same 2,600 square foot home that takes two months, there's overhead associated with that while it's sitting in the factory. That same home in a fully automated facility is going to go through a lot faster. You know, we're doing projections. We don't know what that is, but obviously, again, that same equation, time equals money. By being able to build it at a faster rate, we're going to have less material waste, and event the the cost will be reduced because of that velocity that we're building to. Okay, great. Um, how much clearance around the building site do you need to maneuver the crane? Or the installation? Um, really depends on the project, depends on the size of the project. And again, that's why that feasibility study is important because there's so many variables. Um, size of the crane is going to dictate the size of the components. You know, if you have a really constrained site, then maybe that panel project makes a lot more sense, right? If you want to put an ADU in a backyard and you only have five feet clearance in your side yard. Right? Or do you want to just finish something in the factory and put it up and over with a crane? So there's so many different considerations. It's not a blanket statement. Okay. Um, after bringing manufacturing in-house, does plant prefab see the benefit to bringing site construction in-house? Um, we've, we've looked at that. I think we're building in so many different areas of the right now we're building in Northern California, we've built in Utah, we're building in Southern California. So instead, what we're looking at is really getting partners on board that are familiar with the prefab process and training them so that then we have a, a group of contractors that then we can recommend to folks. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a specific question. What is the typical cost per square foot for multifamily units similar to the Berkeley project? I wouldn't, I wouldn't 
that I, I wouldn't know how to even answer that. Okay. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what the materials were on that. I have no idea what the specs were on the interior. Um, yeah, I would not want to answer that question. So okay. again, again, it's project specific, you know, with the, the answer to the, it's part answer to this question and part answer to that previous question, the greater the volume that we're building at the same time with that repetition, the more the cost is going to go down because we're buying more materials at the same time, right? So the, 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 if we're building one project at a time, there's going to be a greater cost than if we're building 10 of that same project or if we're doing multifamily, if we're building 80 of that same unit, we're going to get a great volume discount based on the fact of that repetition of materials and design. Okay. Um, I'm going to combine, in the interest of time, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here regarding inspections. So um, are inspections always done in the field or are there some prefab component models like, you know, bathrooms and kitchens that are closed up in the factory and they're inspected um, in the factory? Yeah, so everything that's closed up gets inspected in the factory. So plumbing, electrical, um, anything that's behind a drywall, it's completely inspected. So that's why it's important that when these units go on site, there's an insignia in every unit that alerts the local inspector to understand these have already been inspected by the site, the state. They can't open up walls. They can't look at anything that's already closed up. Same with, you know, HERS inspections or QII inspections. Um, those can be done in the factory as well, if that's part of the scope, you know, additional to, and then um, back to that question previous about the panels, if the, there are things left off of the panels, anything that's not completed as part of a panel or part of even a module in the factory, then that does get inspected on site. Okay. And what about the junction um, between the prefab and the uh, worked on on site, for instance, the foundation? Yeah, so um, the local inspector is still going to be looking at all the foundation, all the site utilities, so they'll still be doing those inspections. Um, the inspector will also look at the structural connections, mod to mod and mod to foundation. Um, and then mechanical, electrical, plumbing, all those connections, that still has to get, the, it's final as part of your overall building final on site. Okay. Um, so maybe one more question and, uh, well, I guess maybe I could ask you, Amy, if you have a few more minutes to answer some more of the questions. If not, um, the Hillary has put in the chat that um, Amy and Plant Prefab can respond to the questions we haven't gotten into, but just one more. Um, so uh, have there have been any problems with local jurisdictions accepting um, the DA approval? Um, usually what we recommend when we're working with architects who are going to a municipality that may not have a modular program already set up or, or haven't done modular, the um, Housing Community Development has this great pamphlet and we send that ahead of time. We give that to the architect and make, you know, suggest that the architect goes and meets with the local jurisdiction and then helps them understand because it clearly delineates what factory built housing does and what local inspectors can do and what local jurisdictions can do. Um, a lot of smaller jurisdictions we've found get confused with manufactured housing and modular housing. And that's a huge distinction because we wanna make sure that they understand that this is built to California building code, not to HUD code. Great, thank you. Um, and I think with that, we're, um, yeah, some of the, the responses to the other questions if um, that can be done offline afterwards. So um, big thank you to Amy and um, our MDC legacy partner, Plant Prefab, for this excellent presentation. If you've made it this far, L uh, AIA California staff will be submitting you for the AIA uh, continuing education credit, and it should appear on your transcript in a few weeks. 
AIA California will be hosting more partnered webinars all week long. More details on our 2021 MDC University are available on the AIA California website. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.